So, Angela, what did you think you would be when you grew up? Um, I actually wanted to be a lawyer because I always wanted to get out of things. I always talked myself out of things. If I was in trouble, I knew exactly. I'd give them the look, like lawyers look at judges. <laughs> or oh, I'll talk, 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 debate, debate, debate. So I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I did not know I would be a, in the field working with students today. Oh, wow. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> so all I wanted to be was a mother and a wife. I didn't, I grew up, you know, you watch TV and the wife stays home. She takes care of the kids and the husband. And so I got five kids and I've had three husbands. So anything else for me was icing the cake because I, I wasn't one of those young people that was like, I wanted to be a teacher or anything like that. It was not, I didn't see outside of my little box, I felt like. So never was like, I'm going to be an organizer or an elected official. No, none of those things. What are your happiest moments from those days as a child? Just being able to sit on the porch and jump rope and hula hoop and play jacks, all the stuff that I don't see young people doing today. I, those are my happiest times, like blowing bubbles, like stuff as simple as that. And so I get excited when I see young people outside, just being able to be kids because I feel like that they don't get to be that. What about you? Like the moment during the summer they used to have the fire hydrants on. I don't see kids playing in a fire hydrant. I don't really see them doing nothing active outside besides mm -hmm. getting in trouble most of the time. Absolutely. Um, tell me some about someone from growing up who really inspired you. Um, I would say two. I'd say my grandmother. Sugar she, mama. <laughs> sugar mama. That's my heart. <laughs> She has really molded me into the person I am today. And also, I had a teacher in school. Her name was Miss Ross. She was my middle school teacher. I went to Betsy Ross. I had a teacher named Miss Ross. Wow. And my name is Angela Ross. Ross. <laughs> Get out of here, Rose. <laughs> Nobody would know that. Wow. Oh, wow. Um... Did you ask me the same question? <laughs> so just the women in my community, you know how you, you grow up, we sat on the porch and like we had all of these multi-unit buildings on the block and I would see some of them women struggling with their spouses, their kids, and they got up to do it every day. And so just sitting and watching people like Miss Tina, um, watching Sam, watching my cousin Terrell, just seeing how all these different women would just get up and go for it every day. And no matter what their job was, they was these were the same women I saw come home, fix dinner, you know, watch us on the block because that was a safe space for us. And so just the women that I saw growing up, especially, you know, my mother. My, I saw my mother um, take care of 30 decades worth of young people. And like some of, I was envious to some of it, but I appreciate it. And I realized when I got older, like how many young people she actually touched. Mm. And so I stayed in the work because of her. She is the person who made me get in the work when I was like, oh, hell no, I don't want to be about these people. <laughs> but she is the person who was just like, do what you need to do. Take care of others. That's what you're supposed to be doing. So I look up to my mama. Oh, now your mom was in education, worked in school for years. So what does educational opportunities mean to you? That means allowing young people to be educated outside of the box. Like we, we sit at a desk. We all looking at the chalkboard. We raising our hand. That's all prison mentality now that I think about it. And so it's really thinking about education out the, the box, kids sitting on bean bags, a group of kids maybe doing math and somebody else doing some reading, kids who need visuals looking at stuff on the board, making sure the kids have outside recess where they get to spend some real time, not this 30 minutes stuff that they do, 30 minutes, what is it, 10 minutes to eat, 20 minutes to play. No, some real time out. Hell, nap time, because I be needing to break myself. <laughs> Taking a nap at school, um, being able to have music and world language and art, 
um, and therapy at every school, not this picking and choosing who gets that. And so for me, it's the freedom to be educated in a way that that's comfortable for you. Not nobody telling you that you got to sit at the desk with your arms folded. Or remember, we used to have to stand in the square when we standing in the hallway or you're on level zero. Like all of that. Like, no, you, you're you teaching them to be prisoners. You ain't teaching them to be young people. Describe the first day you remember desegregation efforts started at your school. How was it different? What it what felt familiar? Ooh, because the only thing I'm thinking back to was something recently when COVID happened. Mm. And the students, the suburban students was ready. They had their iPads, tablets, and everything. On the other hand, our kids at CPS, we were not ready. The schools on the south side were not ready for COVID. Students didn't have iPads. They couldn't get online to meet with their teachers. It was... And I was, I, was, I was working at the schools, and a lot of the students did not have technology to be able to do their work, and we fell further behind, which the other schools up north and the suburban schools went ahead, and we still struggling to this day. It's your question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeanette, I'm curious, um, you call um, kind of modern schooling a bit of a prison mentality. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could expand upon specific aspects of that that, you're, that you see that in. So imagine when you're in prison, you're told when to go to the bathroom, you're told when to wake up, you're told when to go to sleep, you're told when to eat, you're told when you can watch, you make a mistake, the entire spaces on lockdown. That's the same mentality we have in schools. We don't give young people a real chance to, so you get in trouble a couple of times. You're seen as the bad student. You always kept from doing stuff. You couldn't go on trips. You couldn't, that sounds like solitary confinement to me. And so to me, we have a prison system, school system. This is not a tool for education. Um, I've seen Angela with young people, like giving them the opportunity. These are preschoolers. And so you asking them to sit in the circle, you having circle time, but also asking them questions, um, being able to work with them in a different way, being able to adhere to them, us not feeling like we're better than these young people because that's a prison mentality. The guards think they're better than the prisoners. No, you just... One incident away from being in prison yourself. And so to me, it's the exact same mentality. It's the same thing. There's no room for creativity. There's no room to do anything. And we all dressed alike. I used to like school uniforms because I felt like it gave parents this thing of if you couldn't afford, you know, expensive gym shoes and shirts and pants, we all look the same. But that's also a prison mentality. Like, it should become as you are. You should you should get to use whether you're going to wear a uniform or not, and you shouldn't be talked about or punished for it. But because we look at it that way and we're taught that way, we look at it as an issue. And so I always compare the school to the prison because it's really what it is. Do you all see that expand into um, the same way, uh, that prison mentality? Um, with the, Do you see the same things happening with that with regard to racial prejudice and bias? Absolutely. You go to a school, we, we, if we compare school from out south to up north, you daggone see the difference. Those kids are learning Chinese and Mandarin. We just figuring out Spanish. We ain't even talking about French. You don't get that until what you're in high school. Mm -hmm. We don't have those same. Angela can speak to it more than I do because one of the things that I was never going to be was a teacher. Because <laughs> it is 30 people with 30 personalities. You you got to be everybody's mama, daddy. I, that I don't have the energy for. But Angela well, I too. lived in the same neighborhood since I was thirteen. So that's the school systems in my neighborhood was all the schools I knew, and me having the opportunity to visit what was this school up north? I remember what. Um, what was the name we went of that to a school up north, and it was a wonderful. It was Oscar Meyer. It was a wonderful school. And I said, why our kids can't have this? They had, a, they had roosters outside. They had a chicken coop. <laughs> they had a garden. The kids was out in the middle of the day just playing out, being kids. It was some kids in a corner reading books. Like, it was just, it was what we would want our school community to see. And it's like, so why do these kids have it and ours don't? 
Exactly. But it was Oscar Mayer. And that made me want to, like, I need to move out the neighborhood. Do I have to move out the neighborhood, for one, in order for my kids to have this type of learning, this type of education? That's, I say this to this day. That's my biggest regret of keeping my kids in the school that they was at because they didn't give them the opportunity to grow. They didn't have, like, my daughter, she went, went on to graduate from college, but my son, he struggled because he, he couldn't learn like she learned. Each child, they learn differently. So you put a child in that type of prison mentality, that's their thought in their mind. So when they do go to prison, that's home for them because they've been used to it from pre-K all the way to eighth grade, down to the lunchroom, the lunchroom tables, the in the squares, like she said, no talking, no movement. So it's still that same prison mentality. Looking back on the school closings, what did you think was the worst part of that? Ooh. Let me start out with the worst. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the best and then the, the worst. worst. Okay. <laughs> so the best part, I love that the parents work together. It wasn't the school system. It wasn't the network. It wasn't anyone in elective officials, the ones who made decisions. They never came out to the schools. So it was the parents who came together. So that was the best uh, decision right there. That was the best that we worked together. And a lot of people think that parents can't work together. Our parents are too ignorant. Or parents this and parents that. But we made it happen. Yeah. <laughs> the worst was, oh, what should I start? Because mm. it's, it's so. It was a lot. It's so much because I see those students that was affected by it. Most of those students was killed. A lot of students are in prison. If they would have kept the records of where each student's at at this moment, they would have known that school closing was not the best choice for no one. So that was that was the the worst. Like knowing now what happened to those kids and what could have happened if the schools remained open. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I had to take a breath. Like. <laughs> Because it's, it's very hurtful, and I still talk to a young boy now, his family that's in, that's in prison. I still talk to his family, and mm -hmm. I talk to other families have lost their, their loved ones because they, they actually made statements to say, school closing's all right. You put me into this another gang territory. Absolutely. And they was afraid to even go. Never showed up. Never showed up. For folks listening, do you guys mind describing what led up to these schools closing and, and what that looked like in that, in that time period? So they were saying the utilization in the building was slow. Like, well, uh, yeah, the utilization in the building was slow. The um, academics was slow. And they was giving us all a bunch of stories of on their end, but we saw it differently. We didn't see what they were saying. We saw a family. That's first and foremost. We saw students that respected one another. Now you go in schools, now students barely respect adults. You would talk to the adults. It was, but they, they talked about schools' failings, but they never supported schools mm -hmm. from the get-go. Schools, you know, schools are giving money based on property taxes. And we know in a bunch of our communities, we don't got a million dollars at that time, because we do have a million dollar home in my ward now. Um, but at the time, there were not a bunch of $100,000 homes, the tax base. They should have been got the schools off the property taxes. But when you want to... Um, disinvest in black people, you know what to do. You know to mess with the money. And so that's exactly what they did. But they gave us all this rhetoric of if we close these schools, we're saving millions of dollars. They were supposed to save like $5 million. But then the school district turned around and spent $4 million on principal trainings, which didn't work. They just lied to us the entire time. They told us that Mollison was doing better to, than Overton, and that was not the truth. When we looked at the scores, that was not happening. Um, Mollison was struggling because Mollison started to see students. We had students who were coming from other countries that because we we can't we we were turning into we wound up becoming an IB school, but before then we kind of saw like different. People wanted to come to Mollison because of the family orientation. My mother was a clerk there. My mother went to work every day at 7 o'clock. Why? Because there are 10 or 15 young people whose families have to go to work early and somebody needs to watch those kids, and she did. And so that was the reason for it. But we also saw 
teachers who have been there 20 and 30 years that were just not supported. They were made to go back to school and get degrees for stuff that they weren't even teaching. And so CPS just lied. And then this, this thing about money, we looking at the books. They sitting, they, and they've been sitting on millions of dollars. They just don't spend them in our school. And at the time that they were talking about closing one of the schools in our community, they were building an annex on another school up north. So y'all have no money, but you're closing schools in our community, and they get in the annex. And those parents found out and was like, we don't even want the annex. And so this was them just lying, just 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 pushing a narrative that they don't have to take accountability for because we're left to steal to help these families. We're left with, fa- with kids going to jail. We're left with these kids that have died. We're talking about kids that never made it to 17, 18, never graduated from high school, never even saw high school. And who pays for that? Because that's a burden that we carry. Like, it was our fault, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. We was there to pick up the pieces, and there ain't no award for that. What would a um, community-led school or um, like the Patriot Hill process look like ideally um, to you both and me? What it looks like for our white counterparts. A school where the LSC has to say so, that hires and fires the principal. A school that allows the LSC to raise funds for just extra stuff, a school that allows the teachers to have some autonomy and not all of this busy work. Mollison stayed on school probation for 20 years. So for 20 years, y'all did nothing. Y'all did the bare minimum. And then somehow students, parents, and the community and the principal are to blame when you all didn't do anything. And it's funny, people ran for office. (laughs) Like, you had the audacity to run to run the city after it, you started the shit. Excuse me. You started the mess. And so it's just, it, it's amazing to me that we know what good schools look like. They're just not for black and brown kids. Y'all have made that clear. And then when somebody calls you out for your racism, then it's, oh, we're not racist. No, yes, you are. Every policy, everything that you all have ever put in when it comes to Chicago public schools, um... And Chicago Public Schools, I used to say, stands for closing public schools because that's all y'all doing. And they do it quietly. They never did it like you you, you know how I feel. You laughing because you know it's the truth. But that's what I used to tell them. Like imagine going to a board meeting and they give you two minutes to bear your heart out. And then they still make the decision, hit the hammer, close the schools. Yeah, one of the things I dislike is people making decisions that don't even step a foot inside the school. See it. They don't step a foot inside the school to see what we go through. We, and when I say we, that mean teachers, parents, administrators, and most importantly, the students. Because they're at the top of the list right now because them the ones that suffers the most. I work in a pre-K um, classroom, and I love pre-K. I love early child learning because that's when kids soak up the most. Mm-hmm. So when I can get those kids at that young age to teach them before they get where they set in their ways, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier napping and rest, and I'd love to hear more about um, why you think that's important and how it can be incorporated into school. Because I don't think we realize that some young people don't even sleep at night. They don't eat until they come to school. And so you, you, you create all the wraparound supports that young people need. And so just imagine this. At home, I got to get my brothers and sisters ready for school. I got to feed them. I got to make sure everybody get there. I'm an adult in my house. So now I'm about to come to school and listen to you when I'm, I'm running my household. And so we have to make a system that supports every young person, regardless of their circumstances. There are some young people that go home at night. All their parents do is fight. They got pimp. They you got young people whose parents are never home because they always working, and so we never hear about those circumstances until somebody gets shot or there's a fire or an accident. When these families are saying to us, "Hey, I need this support. I need this help," we fall. It falls on deaf ears. It takes the, the system too long. I never forget we had a shooting up at the school. The young man came with. They said he had a gun. He had a whole gun. Now every student there said. It wasn't him that had the gun. Somebody put it in his bag. That young man is still fighting a prison system for a gun that was not his, and because the system didn't listen, they just wanted somebody to blame. And so that story happens often. It happens everywhere. And that's a family that we were in connect with that we had to literally help. 
They locked this young man up at the school. They put him in, in handcuffs in front of his peers. What does that do to that young man? And this is a young man who his father was killed. He had no aunties or uncles. It was just him and his mother. And, and so, grandmother. Huh? And his grandmother. And his grandmother. So, and the school was all he had. We supported them in every way we could. But it's like this system failed him. So can I add, in pre-K, we do have quiet time. We call it quiet time. And that's for students to, after all the learning you have, you get to unwind. You don't have to go to sleep if you don't want to. But you can quiet, relax. And so if they can move that throughout the school system, because like Jeanette said, when you're in seventh grade, you're doing so much, you probably don't get to go to bed until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. You just need that quiet time to relax. You don't need a lot of talking, loud noise, Wake up. What you doing? Don't go to sleep. You don't know what this child been through. So I agree with quiet time throughout <laughs> the grade levels. Um, I was wondering if you guys could <clears throat> similarly speak to a little bit of the work that you guys have done since, you know, these school closings. Obviously, it's something that you're both pretty heavily involved in. Can we have some words on that. You want to go first? Or no, you, you okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, since the school closing, of course, I went over to Molliton. I became the LSC vice chair. Jeanette held her title as chair. It wasn't my choice. It was her choice. It wasn't bad. And then um, I went on to work for COCO, and that led to me working with Burke Elementary School as a parent mentor coordinator. And that's to grow parents to not only just volunteer inside the classroom, but see what they do inside the classroom. And then through that program, a lot of my parents' mentors also went on to become teachers through a program called Grow Your Own. And that inspired me as well to work inside the classroom. <laughs> Jeanette. <laughs> so for me, um, the school closings caused me to go on a hunger strike. So we were on a 30-day hunger strike to save Diet Elementary School. And so because of that work, there is only one school in U.S. history that's been closed and opened back up as a public high school, and it's Diet. And so, uh, of course, Angela was there to support us in that work. Uh, a lot of parents, a lot of people from no around food. the country. I wasn't giving them no food. Absolutely. <laughs> it was it was hard. Um, and to be honest, after the hunger strike, I didn't want to organize anymore. I was done. I was like, there is no way in the world that you, it, it is 2015 and you got to go on a hunger strike to save a school. Like, what type of country is this? And I had, um, I didn't want to organize anymore. I had promised Coco I was going to go on a couple of trips with them, but I was like done. And then one night out of frustration, I was like, you know what? We could protest. We could cuss, we could organize, we could go off, but none of that will change until we start to change policy. And I was having a conversation with myself and God, and I was like, okay, so he was like, what you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to run for office. And I was like, did I say that out loud? I'm going to run for office. And so I brought all these amazing women, including Angela that I had met over years, other parents from Overton, parents from Mollison, people I had met at the organization. My mentor at the time, who was our executive director at COCO, was a lady named Jay Travis. And I was like, I'm going to run for office. And they was like, we got your back. And so when I first ran, didn't think I was going to win. I'm like, there's 21 people in this race, so I don't got a chance. Well, when it came down to it, I wind up becoming all the woman Jeanette Taylor, and I wake up with that reality every day, like, these the same people all cussed out. Now, one of them. But I'm also there to make sure that we do the impossible. And so some of the things that we've done since I've been there, you would never dream of having police accountability, ever. Not in our wildest dreams. You would never believe in having a progressive mayor, and we got one. Like, we got a whole Democratic Socialist caucus, which I'm a, I'm a socialist. And I tell people all the time, they go, you a black socialist? Yeah. You, you're a socialist, too. You just don't know it. And they're like, what you mean? If you believe in public power, you're a socialist. And so this, this work and having just 
people like Angela in my life to keep me grounded. Because when you in them spaces, you can get to see why they've turned out to be some jack. I ain't going to say the word. But also just making sure I'm humble and I remember why I'm there and I'm not going to stay forever. I'm not going to be one of those politicians. We should have term limits. But I'm, I'm glad I'm in the space to, to tell a real story because people get there and, A, they forget who they are, but they're also afraid, afraid to tell people who, who they are. And so I tell people all the time, I know what it's like to feed my kids and go to bed hungry. I know what it's like to have to live with my mother because I can't afford the rent. I know what it's like to be wondering how I'm going to get my kids to school. Like, I know that. And so I operate in that sense. I don't make legislation that helps me and hurt other people. And a lot of my coworkers do. And so it's because of this work why I even decided because I was going to be the queen in Ghana and, and move because I, I traveled there in between this time and I like what I saw and I just loved being in the space where I know I'm from. And so for me, it's like, yeah, Lord, you got a few more good years out of me and I'm out of here. I'm going back to Africa. How was the education system out in Ghana? You know what? They pay for everything. They they pay for they pay for lunch. They pay a small fee to go. But you got kids who are in first grade who are doing geometry. Mm -hmm. Like these kids are so overeducated. And it's funny because when people from Africa and other countries come to America, they're made to to get educated again. So let me get this straight. I got a doctorate degree in Ghana, and now you're going to make me come over here and go back to school. That's because America is full of, I ain't going to say it. <laughs> but yeah, the education system is, and it's not, they don't have a bunch of fancy buildings. Like, it's the basics. Like, even, I, and I was just amazed when I was there. So I went through a school, and I wound up adopting the school and sending them supplies while I was there because that's some of the things that they're missing. They only got paper and pen, like stuff that we take for granted. Like we give away billions of supplies. We could send them there. They actually use them. They, and so the education system there is very, very different. These kids are educated. I went to a third grade class and I thought I was in a high school class. Mm. And they knew more about America than I thought they did. But they also... They also see America through this shiny glass. They don't know that black people struggle, people that look like them. They don't really know the, the, the stories about the slave trade. It's so much they don't know about us. They, their introduction to us is BET and stuff like that on TV. And I was like, we, don't, we, we all not rich. Y'all know that, right? We all can't sit. So they have something called tea time. And they literally sit in the circle drinking tea and they're talking to each other about politics there. And ain't no police bothering them. Their prison system ain't nothing. The gate to the prison, I could climb over Angela. You know I ain't climbing <laughs> no gates. And so, like, they don't believe and they believe in, like, restoring. Like, we, we start to talk about restorative justice here. They really believe and live in it every day. And so, for me, I'm like, and they don't got no, no, no they don't care about time. They they have a good time. Like, they party, like, all week. I was like, yeah, this, ooh, y'all party way hotter than America. So, it was really, really interesting. And when I came back, I was like, Un, I was like a little bit ungrateful. Like I'm, I'm with they life. They they want to be in America so bad, but they don't know that us as African Americans, we want to be where you all are. Mm -hmm. And so that that's kind of what I saw as the difference. What do you want your legacy to be? Um, my legacy to be. I always want to leave a positive impact on people. A positive, I want to say not so much of a negative, because sometimes negatives are good if you learn from them. Mm -hmm. Like if my negative story can be used for someone else to grow with, I'm happy with that. But my legacy is always helping people. And that's what people always remember me, at, remember me as, as helping someone. <laughs> Describe what freedom look like to you and your family. No rent, no lights, no gas. No, I got to go pay for food. No, I ain't paying for insurance because you ain't really insured. Um, the freedom to walk out my house and just be a black person that could walk. Not being shot or killed because I bought some Skittles or soda. 
being able to express myself without being seen as the angry black woman, being able to say, that hurts me, don't do that, and people not be offended. Um, being able to, you know, we tell, I feel, I always feel like they tell you that, like, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't, not in this country. Um, I want us to all be equal in a way. Like, I, I hate this big ass little used thing. Like, we are all the same. We all bleed red. Um, I like people, I want people to have their individuality, but I don't want them to apologize for it. Like, who you are, who you sleep with, what you dress, that ain't none of my business. Are you going to roll up your sleeves and make this world a better place? That's what I care about. And so that's what freedom looks like for me and my family. Them just being able to say, I woke up today and decided I wanted to be a truck driver. And it's just as easy to be a truck driver as it is hell to be the clerk at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Like us really deciding what we want to be and not this narrative of everybody going to college. No, everybody is not going to college. <laughs> no, they're not. And everybody is not going to work in a trade. I, I don't know how to screw in light bulbs. That's... Just ain't my thing. I, <laughs> I'm not screwing. I'm not putting no case together. I'm not doing none of that. But to be able to have the option to kind of decide what I want to be and I feel like that you're pushed mm -hmm. into doing something that you, you know that ain't what you want to do. I agree with that because I always want to live life without time. Because mm. if you look at it, life is always have a time limit. You have a time on your life. You have a time with time to go to work. You have a time on how long to be at work. So all day I'm always looking at mm. the time. Dang, that's deep. <laughs> you, know, you talked about um, educational, uh, like during the pandemic, just how obvious like educational and racial inequities were. Um, yes. I'm curious if that made it easier to be in conversation with leaders or if they were still in denial about racism and economic Absolutely, they were still in denial because they were still scrambling around trying to make it work, and it still wasn't working. It still wasn't working, and it's still not working today. It's still not working today. So we need people like Jeanette <laughs> at the council speaking on our behalf to make sure that our kids get it as well as everyone. I'm curious, you know, what you guys envision to bring that freedom to the school systems? What does that look like to you guys? So it starts off with transparency. We don't know what they spend per school. They, like they're keeping us all in the dark. If you talk to parents from up north, they didn't have a clue as to what we was going through on the south side. They didn't know that our schools didn't have technology, that we didn't have iPads, that the internet didn't work in certain parts of the city. It's like, making sure Chicago Public School and the state of Illinois really is as transparent as possible on how we spend the money, um, how the school districts won, who make the decisions, why do certain schools have all this autonomy and other schools on the south and west side don't. And so that's why I am I'm honored that they made me the education chair. Not what I asked for, <laughs> not what I was looking to do. But while I'm there, we, we, we got some truth telling to do, and we got to be honest with the public. Um, Chicago Public Schools received a lot of money during COVID. We ain't spent that money. That money is still sitting there, but they keep raising their salaries. Mm -hmm. We keep putting people in spaces of power who don't flex their power for everybody. It's normally for themselves. And so while I'm in this, while I'm the education chair, we're starting off with transparency. CPS, CTU, City College of Chicago, CCCTU, and what is it, Local 73, all have to work together because those are all the unions and folks that take care of our young people. And so if they're working together, if they're put in the space, we figure it out. Um, like Angela said, we still got COVID cases, but COVID to other people has went away. No, it's like that because they need to make their money. See, it ain't never about us taking care of us. It's never about educating people. It's never about having a healthy world. It's about how much money they can make and how much money they can colonize off people and how they can use people for their own personal gain. And neither one of us are in this spaces for that. Like, it's easy to sell out. Everybody got a price. So I'm going to be honest. My price just comes with taking care of everybody. And they're not going to do that. So can't be bought or sold. And that's a wow moment that, we came from 
the school closing. We was going down there to curse out CPS and the elective officials. And now, <laughs> look, you are <laughs> working for it. And I work for the city. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't write a funnier story. You cannot. That's a wild moment. Ooh, it is. <laughs> Who would have thought all the years when past we would land? Look, right back where we started. <laughs> right like, where we started. Right. <laughs> speaking truth to power. Being in spaces where we could create some real change and just being able to to not allow anybody. They, there's a saying that said, until lions have their own historians, the, the story will always be told by the hunter and it will always glorify the hunt. And so that that's real. That is, is so real. Like, they can't speak to our story. They ain't lived our lives. And those are things that we still, we still, we still fighting for, with those same things today. The fight has just gotten bigger. And there are just more people to see the truth about what the system has done to folks in black and brown communities. So I will continue to help young people, and I'm quite sure Jeanette will. Continue to cuss people who don't do what they're <laughs> supposed to do out. Exactly what I'm going to do. I'm great at it. Have you guys had an educator like, say something to the little you that was a student? I'm assuming you both went to CPS school. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you have hoped they would have said to you that said you have I had a principal tell me, your mouth going to get you in trouble. It does every day. <laughs> Literally, your mouth going to get you in trouble. Yep. She told me, and I never forgot that she said it. And it's funny, I ran into her an adult, and she was just like, don't ever stop speaking your truth. Don't ever do it. And when I think back to what she was saying, it's the same thing. She just said it a different way. And so... I have not stopped speaking the truth, and people don't like it. They'll be okay, though. <laughs> With me, I was given the nickname Mousy. <laughs> <laughs> Mousy, because I was always behind the scenes, but I came out when needed. So. Absolutely. That makes sense. <laughs> that, that is you. That is definitely Angela. Wow. She, looked, she called it right. She called it right. There's obviously been an endless battle with this, and 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 the, there's there's been a lot of hardship, but you guys have had some wins, and I feel like that would be kind of a fun note to end on to 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 hear about some of those wins that you guys have had. So, elected school board. That was a long, hard fight. We have traveled to many cities. <laughs> we got <laughs> stuck. <laughs> Look, you remember when we got stuck in Pennsylvania and they wouldn't fix our truck? <laughs> Just imagine being on a bus with 40 young people. We're going up a mountain because we're trying to go to D.C. Our bus stopped. We had somebody call, and it was like, yeah, you can, you can fix your truck. When we got there and they realized that we were all black, they would not refuse to fix our truck. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're on a coach bus with a bunch of kids, and they refused to. Then when we went to dinner, we went to, what was it, Red Robin? They set us in the black section. They would not rent us hotel rooms, so we slept on a bus with 40 young people. Absolutely. Like, people just, they look, they don't even know. And we this, shouldn't this. have had to fight that hard. We shouldn't. For something that was supposed to have been necessary. And that a was, need. <laughs> and that was around school closing and year-round youth employment. Because we went to testify in D.C. at a hearing. Um they couldn't start any more charter contracts for 10 years. They couldn't close schools for 10 years. We had a bunch of, we, we got some victories. We just don't get to celebrate them. Um, now charter schools are going to be treated like regular public schools. You, they got to have an LSC. They got to have some autonomy. They get to fire and fight a principal. Um, they don't just get to kick young people out when they get ready. They have to have some, they got to do some steps. Um, what other victories we have? Just... Mm. Mm. The personal, main ones counted. <laughs> absolutely. Personal victories, changes internally. I don't know that we, I mean, we alive. <laughs> we still fighting. We just fight on different fronts. Nothing has changed. We're still organized. Mm -hmm. I was talking to her today and she was taking a parent to the store, getting him some groceries. <laughs> like she's been doing that forever. She takes care of everybody else. I tell her, like, you're going to have to take care of yourself. So 
still like we haven't changed. It hasn't like we might not get to hang out as often, mm -hmm. um, but we still working to create a better world. And so personally, and I, I got the utmost respect for Angela because not in nowhere in this lifetime would I be in somebody's classroom. <laughs> I wouldn't like, and I was, so a Angela was in charge of parent mentor and I would come in and sub sometimes when some of the parents would take off and be sick. And I'd be in those classrooms. i like, oh, hell no. <laughs> Pay these teachers what they asking for. They need a million dollars because ain't no way in the world. Is somebody calling my name? I'm trying to help this person with a mad problem. <laughs> this person crying, and I don't know why. It's just it's a lot going, and I don't think we realize that teachers are the only profession that teaches another profession. Makes sense. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. And so personally, I just feel like we, while we may have moved in our careers, we're still fighting for some of the same things we've been fighting for for years. The we're we're kind of coming to a close of the, the time that we have, but um, I want to leave the space to you guys if there's things that have come to mind as we've had this discussion that you want to speak on. One of the things I like that Jeanette said was that learning should be almost like universal. Like we should have kids on bean bags and because each child learned differently. That's what I realized throughout the um, working in the schools. Every child learned differently. Some kids don't learn sitting at a desk. Some might learn just sitting on the floor in that corner with nothing right there. So each child learned differently. I like that. I think I'll say people need to realize that schools are communities. And for a lot of families, they're the less stable foundations that they have in their lives. And because of ignorance and arrogance, they're in chaos. And so I appreciate people like Angela who say, yeah, I'll, I'll mentor parents and I'll help parents, but I'm also going to get in this classroom myself. I'm also going to see what it's like. I'm also going to go back to school because, like, going back to school is hard. <laughs> she went back to school, got that degree, and, like, became an A. Like, everybody don't that – that's not what I'm doing. I, like, I had another school. Um, and so just to see people like Angela say, I'm going to take my life and dedicate it to young people, um, when well, she ain't got two. She got a baby just graduated, but she got two grown kids. <laughs> like, literally, how do you, you – you grow you, – you raise your kids and then you go back to raise other. That's – that's that's kick ass to me. Like you 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 can't get no better than that. And people who still give themselves after being birthed from a system, like the hardest part of this, I think for us was talking about the school closings because we lived them. Like they're still sensitive. I, I still don't talk about the hunger strike. There's still a lot of the parts of merging them schools that we don't talk about. I live right by over ten. I take a different route home just so I won't so have you don't to have see, to the, see building. the building. And I drive past Mollison when I feel like I'm losing myself in politics. I go to our old community. I go to the building I used to live in. Because I got this place. Angela was one of the lucky ones to stay in her community. I wasn't. And so I just drive back just to see. I'll go past the old school. I'll drive down to the, whole, the, the park where we used to sit that's still there. None of the stores that were there when we were kids exist. The store you used to work at that I met you at is gone. <laughs> It's literally gone, and so it's that, and I, I and I forgot about that. I knew you when you was a teenager <laughs> working in the store. And that goes to show what I was talking about, too, of you can go back to a school and mm. see the teachers there. Now it's so many t uh, turnovers of teachers and principals. You can't even give back to the school because you don't know who like you're giving back to. Building. You don't know who's in, who in the building. So, yeah, we need more more teachers to stay inside the schools. Can you just explain what LSE, LCS is? LSE. LSE is called Local School Councils. And Harold Washington is the person, was the, the, the mind around local school councils. Because he said in order for schools to flourish, they have to have local accountability. And so local school councils consist of the principal, two community members, six parents, and two teachers, and two community members. And they are the people who kind of make the decisions for the schools. The governing body of the schools. That's it. <laughs> governing body of the schools. 